ancient ones of western Colorado. Native people believe they've always been in the Americas. This certainly makes sense because scientists have shown that the first inhabitants of western Colorado have been living here for at least 13,000 years. In comparison, the first homesteaders came to western Colorado in 1881, not so long ago. The first people are called Paleo-Americans. Paleo means old. The Paleo-Americans were here when now extinct Ice Age mammals roamed the planet. This was a world of glaciers, giant predators, and extreme cold. During the Ice Age, ocean water froze into massive ice sheets, lowering the sea level on every continent. As a result, a newly exposed land bridge allowed Asian animals to follow new grass and other food supplies from Siberia to Alaska. Human hunters followed the animals. This vast treeless land bridge looked the same for hundreds of miles in every direction. Grass was exposed during the summer. In several thousand years, hunting families were spreading out all over what is now North and South America. Among the animals that migrated to the Americas from Asia were horses, bison, musk oxen, caribou, lions, short-faced bears, dire wolves, moose, and wild dogs. One of the most terrifying of these animals was the short-faced bear that competed with humans for shelter. They stood up to 14 feet tall and could weigh over a ton, 2,000 pounds. Saber-tooth cats and dire wolves also competed with humans for food. You had to be very careful if you left your base camp or rock shelter because humans also served as food to these fearsome carnivores. People probably did not hunt saber-toothed cats and bears for food, but they did occasionally enjoy a good mammoth steak. These huge curved tusk mammals were fierce when angered. The final kill of a mammoth would take all the power, skill, and bravery everyone could muster. Although the meat provided protein for weeks, the majority of a family's diet likely consisted of deer, elk, doll sheep, antelope, bison, and of course the more readily available rabbit and squirrel. The killing of these large mammals required well-crafted weapons. The paleo points used are called clovis points and are the largest of all spear points. It required a lot of people to execute game drives, during which herds of game, including bison, were chased over cliffs. Women at the base of the cliffs would butcher the animals with sharp stone choppers and knives. The meat was dried and the hides were used for shelters, clothing, and warm bedding. Another hunting strategy was to corner the game in a box canyon or in deep snow fields where they couldn't get out. In this image, hunters have trapped a herd of bison in a canyon bottom. The Ice Age bison towered above modern bison and could weigh up to 3,500 pounds. However, Paleo-Americans didn't just eat giant mammals. Deer, elk, and other small game were easier to hunt and provided much of their protein. The oldest known home of the Paleo-Americans in western Colorado is an overhang known as the Eagle Rock Shelter. It's located above the Gunnison River between Hotchkiss and Delta. The site was first occupied 13,000 years ago. It had everything, water, plants, animals, and shelter. The dark layers of ashy soil reveal the shelter was used by people continuously. There are only a few such excavated sites in the United States that contain artifacts this old and reveal constant use from paleo through historic times. These two circular pits lined with smooth, flat river stones were made for cooking. The pits were used more than 5,000 years ago. Archaeologists are studying the soil from the pits to find out what kind of food they cooked in them. Paleo-Americans also lived on the flat top of W Mountain above Gunnison. It's known as the Mountaineer Site. Archaeologists determined that the site is 10,000 years old and that people live there all winter long. Why did they live on top of the mountain instead of the valley? It's probably because the winters were actually warmer on the mountaintop than in the valley below where the cold air settled among the rivers. Similar to the foggy inversions we get in the Grand Valley during winter. The remains of several pit houses were excavated at the Mountaineer site. They may have looked similar to these. The floor was dug down a foot or more and log poles were used to form the roof which was covered with smaller poles and brush. The hole in the center of the roof was the entrance with a ladder. The hole in the rooftop also served as the smoke hole for the fire hearth in the center of the house. Holding your breath and closing your eyes would have been smart while climbing down the ladder over the smoky, smoldering fire. The majority of spear points found at the Mountaineer site are called Folsom points, shorter than the Paleo Clovis points. Attached to long spears, they were used to kill giant bison and other large game. 
The deep groove in the point center may have increased the flow of blood of the victim, allowing for a quicker death of the animal. As glaciers receded at the end of the Ice Age, including those on Grand Mesa, the types of vegetation changed. The giant mammals became extinct. They may not have adapted to the new grasses of the warmer climate. Some think massive group killings by humans may have contributed to the extinctions. A culture known as the Archaic developed from the Paleo-American big game hunters. Archaic people adapted well to a world without mammoths or giant bison and relied on edible wild plants and smaller game such as deer and elk. This hunting and gathering way of life lasted for the next 8,000 years in some parts of western Colorado. The most popular hunting weapon was the atlatl. This throwing stick allowed the hunter to propel a spear much further and faster than it could fly if thrown by hand. The atlatl was used around the world for thousands of years. Archaic people followed the seasons, taking advantage of the times when food was most plentiful in certain areas. In late spring, they tracked herds of bighorn sheep, deer, elk, and antelope up to the higher elevations. Summers were spent on Grand Mesa, the Uncompahgre Plateau, and other nearby mountainous areas. Here, wild foods were dried and saved for the winter months, when there would be no plants to harvest and hunting would be difficult. In the fall, families moved down to the lower elevations to harvest acorns and pinion nuts. As winter approached, they settled into their rock overhangs or pit houses in river valleys and side canyons. Come spring, they'd start the seasonal circuit all over again, traveling to their familiar campsites at higher elevations. Archaic people still used rock shelters and pit houses for their homes below the mountains. The cutaway details the pit house interior, even showing a ventilation system to provide fresh air. Vents were more common in later years. Rock overhangs that faced south were the warmest. Families might stay in the overhangs for just a few days or for several months, depending on how much water, game, wild plant food, and firewood was available. If they stayed longer, they could have made a pole and brush enclosure similar to this one for more protection from the elements. The pinion pine was one of the most valuable plant foods for people throughout the West. Crushed nuts could be mixed with berries and meat to make pemmican, similar to today's protein bars. Pinion sap also was used to coat baskets to make them watertight. Juniper berries are bitter but could be crushed and mixed with other foods. The bark of the juniper tree is stringy and soft, perfect for starting fires, roofing houses, and being crushed into powder to make absorbent baby powder. Juniper wood burns slowly in cooking fires. Fremont barberry provides fairly sweet berries in the fall of the year. The twigs of the Mormon tea plant were boiled to make a drink that could keep one alert and was used medicinally for sinus issues. The pads of the prickly pear cactus were burned off, then cut up and cooked in stews. The red fruit, called tunas, are sweet and can be eaten raw. For thousands of years, the amaranth plant provided native people with seeds full of nutrition. Imagine how long it took to gather enough tiny seeds to make a decent meal. To grind and pound nuts, seeds, and dried meat, people used flat stone matates with small hand stones called manos. An easy hike up Big Dominguez Canyon near Grand Junction takes you to several boulders covered with archaic petroglyphs. These are carvings, not paintings. Most often, archaic people carved bighorn sheep, bears, bear claws, and human figures. In the latter part of the archaic period, roughly 3,000 years ago, a notable pictograph or painting style became popular. Nearly life-sized red figures were painted on canyon walls in the western edge of northwest Colorado. Similar pictographs can be seen in Canyon Pintado, or Painted Canyon, on Colorado State Highway 139 between Rangeley and Grand Junction. From Paleo through Archaic times, native people used the flat area on top of Vail Pass as a base camp where the rest area is today. From there, they could hunt game and gather plants in any direction, coming back in the evening to prepare food and sleep under the stars at more than 10,000 feet. The trail over the pass has been used for thousands of years as people traveled over the Rocky Mountains. Roughly 1,500 to 2,000 years ago, the lives of the archaic people in western Colorado changed dramatically. At the heart of these culture changes was the arrival of farming, the three main crops are known as the Three Sisters, corn, beans, and squash. 
The archaic hunters and gatherers planted some corn but still relied heavily on wild plant foods. But very gradually they began to settle in villages of pit houses. Corn was becoming more important to their survival and they needed to be closer to their cornfields for longer periods of time. About 1,500 years ago, the farming lifestyle led to the rise of several significant cultures throughout what is now the American Southwest. These include the Fremont and Ancestral Puebloan, formerly called the Anasazi, of western Colorado. Note the other farming cultures covering most of Arizona and New Mexico. Trade between all these groups was common. The Ancestral Puebloans lived in a large area surrounding the Four Corners, where the states of Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah meet. In southwest Colorado, remains of their pueblos, or villages, such as those at Mesa Verde National Park, tell the story of hunters and gatherers who developed a farming culture that lasted roughly a thousand years. Images of handprints, birds, bighorn sheep, and human figures are common petroglyphs of the ancestral Puebloan. Petroglyphs are rock carvings, not paintings. On the mesas now called Mesa Verde National Park and the Ute Tribal Park, acres of pinyon and juniper trees were cut down to plant corn, beans, and squash. Large, finely woven baskets found by archaeologists in the overhangs led to naming these first farmers basket makers. Gradually, the farmers moved from the overhangs to the mesa tops, where they built America's first apartment houses, sharing house walls to conserve their building materials. You can still see the mounds of rocks from these small villages scattered throughout the bean fields northwest of Cortez. Stone, wood, clay, and plants provided materials for making many tools of the ancestral Puebloans. Can you describe how each of these artifacts was used? After many centuries, Mesa Verde farmers abandoned their villages on top of the mesas and moved back into protected overhangs the same ones their ancestors lived in during the basket maker period. Why did they want to live in cramped quarters that were dangerous to access? Answer: They now needed to protect their food, water, and possibly their families from enemies. The population had increased dramatically and the natural resources were disappearing. Game was scarce. You might have to travel miles to find firewood. Drought caused crops to fail because the water sources were drying up. People moved into the cliffs to protect springs that still bubbled in the rear of the overhangs. Storage rooms were built in the cliff dwellings to protect corn, beans, and squash from invaders. The doorway into Balcony House could be defended by one person with a large rock. The intruder would be unable to offer any defense. The only other entrance to this cliff dwelling is up a ladder, which easily could be pushed backward if enemies began to climb it. Have you heard of archaeoastronomy? It's a combination of archaeology and astronomy. Chimney Rock National Monument, located between Durango and Pagosa Springs in southern Colorado, offers both at this ancestral Puebloan site. Every 18.6 years, the lunar standstill occurs. The full moon rises between two spires each month for nearly a year until it starts traveling south again. The ancestral Puebloans were aware of this phenomena and built a ceremonial center at the base of the spires. This is the archaeology part. Some think Chimney Rock provided valuable information about solstices, equinoxes, and other such astronomical events. The Chimney Rock National Monument website offers details of guided tours and presentations available throughout the year. Archaeologist Sally Crum uses the lunar standstill at Chimney Rock as the backdrop for the climax of an exciting tale of prehistoric trade in her book Race to the Moonrise, An Ancient Journey. Whether due to drought, overpopulation, internal warfare, decree by spiritual leaders, or all of the above, the Mesa Verde region was abandoned roughly 700 years ago. The people moved south and joined the many other Pueblo villages in New Mexico and Arizona. The modern Pueblo people continue many of their ancient ways, some of which may date back to the ancestral Puebloans. To the north of the ancestral Puebloans was the Fremont culture. These people lived in Utah as well as the western part of Colorado. Fremont sites are located near Grand Junction on Glade Park and north along Douglas Creek on the way to Rangeley. The Fremont culture lasted approximately 900 years. Many Ute people believe they are descended from the Fremont. 
Unlike their ancestral Puebloan neighbors to the south, the Fremont were just part-time farmers, continuing to hunt and gather food while growing small plots of corn near pithouse villages. The Fremont man on the left is carrying a bow, a weapon that replaced the atlatl. A bow could project an arrow faster and farther than an atlatl could. In addition, a hunter could put up to 100 arrows in the quiver he carried on his back, much handier than carrying just one or two very long spears. Note the cornfield in the distance, and the granary, the petroglyphs, the pottery, the matate, and the clay figurine. The figurine looks like the petroglyph figures on the wall, adorned with jewelry. The Fremont petroglyph body shapes have arms and legs, headdresses, and lots of jewelry. Figures often carry shields in what may represent human heads. Perhaps the rock art was meant to discourage other groups from entering their territory, kind of like, we're armed and dangerous, or they were telling stories of battles. In a Utah canyon, not far from the Colorado border, a rancher kept a secret for over 50 years. The canyon has a permanent creek running through it, and for centuries the cliff walls protected the homes, storage rooms, rock art, and thousands of tools of Fremont farmers. Nobody knew about it until a few years ago. The rancher, Waldo Wilcox, was afraid people would take all the artifacts that had not been disturbed since the Fremont left over 700 years ago. Knowing he couldn't protect the Fremont villages forever, he recently allowed the artifacts in Range Creek Canyon to be collected by archaeologists. The Fremont culture became less prominent as the Ute culture eventually took its place. Many Ute people believe they are direct descendants of the Fremont. Today, the three Ute tribes take pride in their heritage while adapting to a modern world. A program soon will be available that will be solely about the Utes. Evidence of Colorado's native heritage is still visible in Western Colorado. That's why it's important to show respect for a culture that thrived for thousands of years without compromising the land. How does it make you feel when you see destruction of this ancient work? Learning about these people leads to an appreciation of their life ways and, hopefully, protection of what they left behind.